They don't care about faster cars. They care about your needs. We all need someone to support and take care of. And when it comes to technology, we need a team that truly understands us. Meet the experts who care, who understand the power of individuality, and who are committed to developing new technologies and experiences that improve people's lives. We believe that caring is more than just a buzzword. It's a commitment to create technology which perfectly fits human beings. And we are proud to be a part of that mission. We're not just developing new technologies. We are creating exciting, safer mobility. Because when we care, anything is possible. Very exciting. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Tech Talk, The Psychology of Mobility. Today, we are inviting you to look behind the scenes of what our hidden champions, the experts that you just saw in that video, do before engineers at Continental begin their journey of innovation. Before we kick things off today, I'm going to quickly go through some housekeeping notes and introduce myself. My name is Christina Clark. I'm responsible for external communications for Continental Automotive North America, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. After all four of our experts have presented, there will be time at the end to ask your questions. You may do so by either posting your question in the chat or using the hand raise button at the top of the screen. And we'll get to Q&A. We'll answer all of your questions after our presenters have um, given their, their talks. Please also be aware that today we are recording this Tech Talk with the exception, excuse me, of the Q&A. And we'll make sure that when we're posting this to our website, your names and images, they are not going to be posted in order to preserve your privacy. Now, let me briefly introduce our experts that you'll hear from. First, you will hear from our external speaker, Christoph Bernhard. He is the award-winning, he's with the award-winning consultancy, Custom Interactions and they specialize in creating data-driven and user-centric automotive design. Trust in technology is a very important factor for him. Our second speaker, Guido Meyer Arnett, is a psychologist and an expert in creating perfect human-machine interface systems based on deep user understanding and consideration of human factor design principles. Our third speaker will be Sebastian Weiss. He is a traffic psychologist and human factors expert by training. His daily mission, create products with high acceptance and comfort rates, thereby creating efficient, positive mobility experiences. And finally, you will hear from Jochen Moller. Jochen has won more than 50 design and innovation awards in the last decade, and he will give you some insights into how he goes about his design process. So with that, let's get to our first presentation. Christoph, the stage is yours. Yes. Thanks a lot, and uh, hello everyone out there. Um, thanks a lot for the warm introduction. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, yeah, my name is Christoph, and today uh, in my talk, I want to show you why a positive user experience is important for driving, but also for vehicle development and development of vehicle systems. So let me really short, uh, shortly uh, give some facts about me. As was introduced, I am a psychologist. I hold a PhD in psychology, and uh, I'm working as a deputy head of operations at Custom Interactions. Uh, I have six years of experience in the automotive industry in applied psychology, with a focus especially on human-machine interaction, assistance systems, and applied human perception. But, of course, I am not here today to talk about me. I am here today to talk about psychology and driving. And um, I want to show you why psychology and a positive mobility experience is important. And 
I would like to start with an example. So let's look at a short video that shows what can happen um, or what on what ideas users have if a system does not have a good user experience. So please start the video. So what happens if a system does not have a positive user experience? Well, the users will find a way to improve their experience. And this also includes doing things that might not be safe. So talking about safety, um, let's have a look at some accident statistics. What you see here is the number of numbers of accidents involving causalities from the years 2000 to 2021 for the countries Japan, Mexico, USA and Germany. As you can see, for example, for Japan, uh, the accident numbers have been uh, have been decreasing for the last years. But in other countries in Germany and Mexico, they stayed largely constant. And for USA, they have been even increasing for increased for a certain period of time. So what does the industry do to reduce those accidents numbers? Well, one method is they are introducing driver assistance systems, which should support the human driver, which automate some parts of the driving tasks. But as you can see, those assistance systems are hardly connected to the development of the accident numbers. But why is that? Of course, there are a lot of different reasons for this, but I would like to highlight here one important reason, and that is that a lot of those systems do not have a good user experience. And that's the important point here. An innovation will only succeed to increase road safety if it has a positive user experience, because then it will be used by drivers. Let's have a look back at the first example that I showed you. Um, here I showed <clears throat> a system that offers partially automated driving. That means that the system is in control of the car. It's maneuvering the car, but the driver still needs to be, um, uh, needs to stay uh, focused. He needs to focus, he needs to monitor the system, and most importantly, he needs to hold the wheel doing the system is operating the car. That means that he is not able to engage in any other tasks. And now, I think this is not a really joyful thing to do. Just sitting there watching the car drive, but not able to do anything. That's not really funny. So what are the drivers doing? And that's what we see really often um, in research. What they are doing is they are engage disengaging. They do not focus on the system as they should. They are trying to do other things. They are trying to do things that are important to them. Um, so what will the drivers do? They will engage in other tasks to fulfill the needs they have. So human drivers are bad in monotonous tasks. They are bad in simply monitoring. And if they have to do this, they will focus on other tasks, even if this leads to risks. Let's have another example, a lane keep assistant, which is a specific automated system that helps drivers to stay in the lane. Um, but it has a two or it has a major problem. And that is whenever a driver wants to change the lane without indicating this, the system will react against the driver. It will push against the real movement of a driver. And my, some systems might even sound an, um, a, um, a warning signal. Um, and now I'm sure I'm not, I'm very sure that I'm not the only one who sometimes changes the lane without using the turn indicator. Um, but in these cases, the system will work against me and it requires me to always use the turn indicator. And what is the result of such a requirement of the system? Well, that's what we see. The lane, such systems are not used, they are turned off by the users. And why is that? Well, let's summarize. It's because it has a negative user experience. So if a system delivers a negative experience, drivers will not use it. Well, now, what we saw is 
a, a system is not used when it has a bad user experience. But what is a positive user experience? According to Hassan Saal, there are two major dimensions. Um, and this is on one side, the pragmatic quality, and on the other side, the hedonic quality. The, pr the pragmatic quality describes how easy or efficient a system supports the user in what he wants to do. And this is what most manufacturers are focusing ab about. This is the usability. How easy is the system to use? But there is also another factor that is really important and often not considered by manufacturers, and that is the hedonic quality. Hedonic quality describes to what degree system use evokes positive experience, such as joy or pleasure. Now, both factors are important, but being safe and easy to use, it's not enough. A system also needs to give his users a good hedonic quality. It has to bring them joy, pleasure in use. Only then it will evoke a positive mobility experience. Now, how can we increase or promote a positive experience? Well, according uh, to what we know, there are three major characteristics that are important. The first one is novelty, which describes the extent to which the user perceives the product as innovative or creative. The next one is attractiveness, which describes the user's overall impression and how much users like the product. So do they, do they find it annoying or do they find it enjoyable? And the last one is stimulation, which describes whether the user perceives the product as exciting or motivating to use. If a product has a good pragmatic quality and fulfills these three needs, then it will also result in a great mobility experience and the users will use the system. Now, let's look at the example from before, the lane change assist. This system replaces um, a very specific task of the driver, but it adds nothing new to the driving task. The user can simply monitor the system. That is nothing new. And so it does not really has a good novelty. Moreover, it is not stimulating the driver because as I said, he cannot engage in any other tasks. He cannot stimulate himself. And the system gives bad feedback it uh, pushes against real movements if you do not use the turn indicator. It even gives warning signals that might signal other people in the car that the driver has made a mistake. So this can, or this is perceived as rather annoying. And that's why here such a system does not bring a good user experience. Let's look at a positive example, augmented reality information. This, um, this is a system that brings new information to drivers, information that would not have been there usually. And um, with that, it has a high novelty. The information that are shown are provided directly where the user needs them to be. They are easy to integrate for the user, easy to perceive, which makes it enjoyable to use it. And it stimulates the driver by giving always new information to him. So, here we have a good user experience. So in summary, systems can evoke a positive mobility experience by addressing human needs for novelty, attractiveness, and stimulation. But what is now the role of psychology in all of this? Well, what, what is psychology? Psychology describes how human experience their world and how they behave. This includes how we act. This includes our perceptions. That includes our cognitions. It includes how we feel. It includes uh, the need that we have and it includes the mot motivation. Now I'm sure um, the connection to driving is uh, rather obvious. Driving is a task that is highly perceptual and cognitive. You need to perceive different information. You need to process them quickly to react to them. So here we have a lot of things uh, going on that happen 
um, yeah, in this area of that I just described, um, um, that can be described from a psychological view. The other part is the positive experience. Also here we have a connection. As we saw in the slides before, um, positive experience is especially about understanding the needs and fulfilling those needs. And this is exactly what we in psychology are doing. So what is the role of psychology? Psychology provides knowledge, methods and tools to analyze and understand needs, wishes and demands of drivers. And what is our gain to integrate psychology into the development of vehicles or vehicle systems? Well, I see four important areas. First of all, we can increase system use by, by um, creating a positive experience and so motivating the driver to use the system. We can increase safety by supporting how the uh, drivers can perceive and process information. We can improve the brand perception by um, evoking positive emotions that are connected to the brand. And finally, we can increase market impact by fulfilling the needs that our customers have. So let's have let's look at a last example that shows how important it is to fulfill the needs of human drivers and what can happen if those needs are not fulfilled. Please start the video. Okay. So what you see, driving can be a positive experience but only if it fulfills the needs of the human drivers. And if it, if it does not fulfill the needs of the human drivers, then it can get pretty messy. Okay, so how do we integrate psychology into the development of products? How do we bring a positive, uh, positive experience? Well, for this, there's a familiar process that is called the user-centered design, user-centered design process or approach, and uh, this approach um, brings the user into the center of the development. Um, it tries to analyze the needs, the wishes, the demands of the users. It gives the user the possibility to evaluate the system and to bring their own ideas, their own wishes into the development. And this is a, um, this is a process and approach that is used also here at Continental, and I'm sure that you will hear much more of it uh, in the following talks. So for now, let's conclude. New innovations will not succeed to increase road safety. They do not have a positive user experience. Being safe and easy to use is not enough to create such a positive user experience. A positive experience can be created by fulfilling the user needs for novelty, attractiveness, and stimulation. Psychology provides the knowledge, method, and tools that are needed to analyze and understand such needs, wishes, and demands. And the user-centered design is a way to bring this knowledge into the development of new systems. And with that, I thank you all very much for your intention. And now I would like to hand over to Guido. Yeah, thank you, Christoph, and uh, welcome from my side um, as well. So uh, talking a little bit more about uh, experience, I would like to ask you, well, what was your most positive experience in the last year? So. Has it to do with a hobby of yours or with your vacation? So clear is perceiving and experience as positive has to do with your personal background, your preferences, uh, your wishes and your situation you are in. But interestingly, your perception of what is positive, well, may change over the time. So maybe you never thought um, about to spend your vacation in a RV. Um, but your trip in Canada was so nice that this has become your most favorite way of traveling. So overall, there are several influencing factors which lead to a transformation of experiences, and that counts for mobility experiences as well. So um, 
if we take a look at uh, the reasons for well why trans or why we have such a transformation in mobility experiences over the time you can say that one example is that we have to coordinate several means of transportation. So highly automated vehicles, e-bikes, e-scooter, public transformation, and, um, and so forth. And that requires also an adaptation of the human machine interface structure, where on the one hand, you know, innovative uh, technologies like speech-based dialogues or huge pillar-to-pillar -pillar displays are allowing us a very flexible and adaptive way of information presentation and information management. And on the other hand, user needs have changed over the time as, as well. So besides traveling from A to B, communication entertainment needs become very important. And, uh, those so-called tertiary tasks or secondary tasks will become more and more primary tasks, also with um, the help of highly automated um, driving. And um, the uh, following little movie shows such a transformation from more uh, secondary tasks to primary tasks. So let us have a look to the little vision right now. So on her trip, the driver would like to pick up a friend at the airport and receive information accordingly. So driver then starts in a highly automated driving mode and took over then in, in order to drive manually and to pick up the co-passenger at the airport. So since the vehicle is driving in a highly automated driving mode, they are able to relax, to communicate and to enjoy and also to receive important traffic information. And the passengers get additional tourist related information in an augmented way. And with this, they can really enjoy the trip. Continue the trip and automated to driving mode, and then finally reach their destination. So I think what the video pretty good shows is a deep involvement of the users into communication and entertainment tasks. They were quite delighted in, in communication and enjoying the drive with some tourist related information. And that clearly shows that when it comes to mobility, we have to consider that we are much more just rational thinking people. At the end, it's not the brain which drives a car, it's the human being with his experiences. And because of that, I will highlight a little bit more of the term user experience and then link to psychology, which was already introduced by Christoph in the previous speech. So user experience means that all aspects of using a product or services will be affected. So that means everything which contributes to perceptions, beliefs, emotions, preferences, or the behavior of the user that will be all addressed completely. And that counts for the experiences before, while and after the usage of a specific product or service. So user experience, as already mentioned, touches always two basic dimensions. So the pragmatic dimensions has to do with traffic safety and well, more classical usability related criteria like effectiveness or efficiency of the usage of a product. Where the so-called hedonic dimensions are addressing more the emotional appeal of appeal of a product or, or service. And now the question is, what are the basic dimensions which will contribute to user experience? And 
for sure one dimension and one huge influence and factors the intention and the goal of the user and his goal for instance is to get something for lunch or have a have a rest and that is because the condition of the user is he's hungry and he he's somehow tired uh, due to his trip so he's strongly motivated to find a restaurant on his journey and therefore He's asking a digital assistant, for example, for a restaurant. And because the system is knowing pretty good the context, the environment, the system is able to propose several restaurants which are nearby the, um, the route. And uh, since the vehicle is a highly automated one, the, the system is, is offering uh, several options by presenting pictures um, of uh, specific restaurants. And um, the user is pointing at an image and at the same time saying, hey, guide me to this restaurant, please. So, of course, all the influence and factors which leads to a certain mobility experience are correlated with uh, psychology fields. And I like to highlight and pick out some examples to show which psychology dimension is linked to a specific experience or ability of uh, the user. For example, the topic perception. So presenting information in a augmented reality head-up display, for example, lowers reading time and therefore contributes clearly to a higher usability or traffic safety. So with this, um, well, we have some contribution to the pragmatic experience dimension efficiency in that case. Um, based on the analyzing of, for instance, um, the head pose or the line of sight, we are able to detect the attention focus of a person. And with this, we can support the user with some guiding information, like in that case, an intersection assistant, which was developed together with the University of Darmstadt in Germany. Um, such an intersection assistant is to support the user while he is entering roundabouts or making left turns at complex intersections. So, and that will be also done with the help of um, a trained and alert typical user behavior. So, um, another interesting topic is, and now we are talking about emotions. A survey from Virginia Tech is clearly indicating that uh, strong emotions like uh, sadness or anger raises the risk of an accident by nearly 10 times. So the question is, what can we do in that case? What are our countermeasures? And clear is the proposal, what you can see in the little image on the right side is the proposal of an empathic digital companion saying, shall we take the happiest route? May not help for every user, but other ones would rather prefer a specific music title or so. So um, it's important to say that and now we come to another example that people typically want to stay connected to their family and friends. And uh, we already saw this little movie from uh, Christoph uh, showing uh, coordinating a birthday party. Yeah. And uh, so there's uh, a clear um, motivation behind that is also the fear of missing out something. And that's no wonder that um, smartphones will be used while driving. About 12% of the drivers are reporting that they sometimes read text messages on their cell phones. And 9% of the driver are reporting that they sometimes even send text messages. So that's a huge, a big issue. So the solution is to our understanding that we those needs take very, very serious and find additional countermeasures just besides penalizing uh, people, 
and uh, we think wouldn't be well a good path and a good approach to apply uh, powerful HMI technologies like a good text-to-speech application, speech input, speech dialogue-based um, structures, or offering the user to activate um, the highly automated driving mode, or to use a digital assistant or whatever, instead of, you know, um, penalizing the people. We take the needs serious and try to develop technologies accordingly. Um, so we see that there are several factors and dimensions which influences our experience. So the question is now also, what can we do to consider this? And as already mentioned, we need to have a clear understanding about the end user, his wishes, his current states, his traits and his abilities and so forth. And that is the reason why we are applying um, the so-called user-centered design approach. At the end, that means a very systematic involvement of the end user in our technology development processes. And it's also important to mention that the user-centered design will always follow three basic principles. So that is, on the one hand, to really focus very, very early on the end user by doing an iterative approach um, and then I have to jump back, sorry. And uh, a third very important um, topic is that we have to test. And uh, we have to test in between to make sure that there are some basic information really understandable. We have to test the overall acceptance level. And at the end, we have to test all the features and functions which, which will be completed in an entire working system and check out whether they fit to traffic safety related criteria, for instance. And um, the user-centered design with this yeah, is a precondition for what we've called a holistic HMI approach. So again, the starting point for the technology development is the end user. And with this, we are able to derive technology requirements. So such a holistic HMI approach at the end leads to a positive mobility experience to our understanding. And to summarize this a little bit more, um, holistic approach means we understand the end user considering his needs. We are understanding um, the environment, take to, into account the current vehicle status and all together with this, we can well apply and provide HMI solution which perfectly fit to a given context. Just to mention an example, the adaptation of information output modality switching from a visual channel to an auditory channel or applying uh, haptical tactile cues as well and also reducing the amount of uh, information in case we are figuring out that uh, there is a higher risk of getting overloaded, for instance. So what we see is um, that really user understanding is key. And uh, with this, I like also to mention a quote from Henry Ford, which clearly indicates that this is sometimes really quite difficult to really understand what the user means and says and really to derive appropriately the need behind. So he was saying, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So um, what we can see is it's about asking the right questions, selecting a suitable method, um, in order to figure out the, the context and, a, and, and the needs and always have in mind what is the situation and the context where the user is currently in. And I like also to provide a, um, a little example for a uh, method right now um, to find out what the user will needs if it will come to automated driving. 
Um, so we can also ask for attitudes, we can ask for uh, concerns, and with this we have conducted a so-called mobility study in the context of um, automated driving. And uh, that clearly shows that uh, mistrust is a various, very, very serious uh, issue. So more than 50% of the participants agree to statements like automated driving scares me somewhat, or they agree to a statement like, I don't believe that it will function reliable. So that really shows us, okay, if it come to the uh, HMI development for a um, automated driving vehicle, then well, one central goal has to be to increase the overall trust. And the question here is, what can we do in order to enhance, to build up trust? And one guiding principle in that case was be transparent and clear much as possible. So, well, by showing what the vehicle is really recognizing and showing what is the current maneuver, what will be the next maneuver. And based on an iterative testing, one finding was to enhance the system transparency by, well, following a multimodal approach. So really using visual cues, auditory, also tactile um, cues, that was very important as well. And um, in that context, also uh, the augmented display seems to be a very promising um, device because it clearly shows, well, what is the vehicle recognizing? So in, 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 in that case, um, it, indica it, it indicates with the help of the uh, orange sickle and vehicle which is driving in front of you. And you see maybe this orange uh, sickle and uh, this kind of uh, augmentation is a trust building measure besides other ones. Again, showing what is the next planned maneuver, for instance, that's also very important. Yeah, to conclude, so we saw that transformation with mobility experiences, uh, they took place and um, the non-driving related tasks will become most important. And uh, key is that we create technologies according to user needs. And key for this is to really um, have a good understanding, a deep understanding about what the user at the end are expecting, what are their abilities, what are their wishes. And this will be done with the help of a user-centered design approach. And uh, that is also one important thing to mention. Context consideration is also very, very important. And at the end, um, we come up with HMI solutions and innovation, which will perfectly fits to users' ex expectations and um, abilities. Yeah. So let us conclude with a statement where we say that's a key statement for us. Well, saying user-centered design with a clear focus on a deep user understanding is the enabler for technologies which lead at the end to an inspiring mobility experience. So we see us as the advocate of the end user. And as we see that trust in technology is uh, essential, I'd like to hand over now to Sebastian, who will highlight this uh, topic furthermore. So thank you for the moment. So thank you, Guido. Um, in my presentation, it will be all about trust. And the main question, blind trust, do we really want this? Do we as developers aim for a blind trust in you as the user, or is it rather something that trust should be calibrated? So in our role as the user's advocate, we put the user's needs in the center of our design process. So you as potential users are our focus. So let's define first what is meant by trust. And with this, I want to all to go a step back, more or less. 
forget about the technologies we just told you about, forget about all the innovations and just think you are climbing a steep and rocky mountain. In the end, you need to grab your hiking partner's hand to make it to the mountaintop. So how do you achieve your goal, this mountaintop? Why do you even put your whole faith in somebody else's hands? It is because you trust this other person standing on top of you. So what does it mean exactly to trust somebody? In a definition by Lee and C, they define trust as follows. Trust is the attitude that an agent will help achieve an individual's goals in a situation characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. So this definition of trust does not only account for the trust in other people, like in the example that I just gave you. In fact, this definition has its origins in a theory of trust in technology. So trust in technology is in fact something quite similar, because how can this woman here stay relaxed while she's driven in her automated vehicle? Also here accounts, the technical agent, here the automation, will help to achieve the woman's goals, namely to arrive safely at her destination. So she does so even though the situation itself, urban traffic with many different other vehicles around, vulnerable road users, is characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. So it is trust in the end of this woman in the automated driving system that makes her feeling relaxed and lets her enjoy her ride. So this example shows how important it is to trust in a technology to enable this technology in the first place. But does this also account when you're standing outside of a vehicle. I will show you now a short video to see that not only when sitting inside a vehicle, but also when interacting with an automated car as a pedestrian, it is crucial to trust. So please play the video. So you just saw an automated vehicle communicating with an LED light band that it is safe to cross the road here. It does so because you as the pedestrian need to know whether the vehicle is stopping or is beginning to drive again. So only if you trust the automated vehicle and its signal, and especially the way of its communication, you can cross the road safely. So, as already stated in the name, the header of my presentation, should you always trust blindly? No matter if you're climbing a mountain, sitting in an automated vehicle, or crossing before an automated vehicle, should you just put your fate into the other side, the human agent, the technical agent? Or in other words, should we as developers always aim for a maximum in trust? The answer here is a clear, it depends. But let, let's again take a step back. How exactly is trust developed and what can lead to distrust or maybe something new for you, also overtrust? Beginning with an easy example here. You all may have kn known this situation. You double check your hotel door, your apartment door, before you leave, even though you know that you just locked it one second before. Do you not trust that locking the door in fact does lock it? Do you not think that a lock overall is a mechanism that is trustworthy? I give you this example to show that the development of trust is not always something rational. Let's look at this example in detail. The capability of a lock to hinder somebody of entering a door so its actual trustworthiness is rather high. Its mechanism itself is very trustworthy and easy. Nevertheless, you might have had one experience with one lock that in fact did not lock correctly. When arriving then back at your room, you realized that the door was open the whole time. So consequently, the 
your personal trust in logs generally is mitigated and you better double check after lock, locking. So you distrust logs even though they're objective trustworthiness. The capability of the mechanism itself just stayed the same. So trust is not only relying on the capability of something, but also in your personal trust that you lay in them. So when you already might have distrust in the capability of locks, so you better double check after leaving and locking your room. How is it with something more complex? So let's come back to the example of automated driving. As said, this woman here trusts the automated driving functions of the vehicle. That is why she can enjoy her ride. But does she really trust blindly? On the one hand, blind trust, as just mentioned, would mean, would mean that she would trust the automated driving functions no matter how capable they in fact are. So in this case, if the automated driving functions are not capable of handling every driving situation, this lead, can lead to something we call overtrust. Your individual trust in the system is higher than the actual capability of the system. And this overtrust, as in this picture here, can lead to a misuse of the system. For example, sleepy, sleeping in an only partly automated vehicle. Or, as the previous speaker already showed, gaming or interacting with your mobile phone when being in a just partly automated system in which you still have to observe your surroundings. On the other hand, if you distrust the automated driving functions, even though they are rather capable and trustworthy, you may be skeptical, intervene and stop the automation. So you would react maybe as this person down here, you would be confused and maybe disuse the system as already shown before by, for example, disabling automated driving functions like a lane keeping system. Only if your trust is calibrated with the actual trustworthiness, so the capability of the technology, you can enjoy your ride and drive as relaxed as this woman here above too. She knows of the capabilities as well as the borders, the limitations of the automation, of the automation drive, driving system. So, so she knows how much trust she exactly can put into a system that might be not completely mature yet. Again, like in this video, this does not only account with sitting inside an automated vehicle, but also when interacting with one as a pedestrian. As long as the automated driving system is not completely error-free, trust must be calibrated. So just watch at this video again to show you this example. So let's consider why also in this example, calibrated trust is the one you and we as developers should aim for. As the automated driving systems also currently are not completely mature, not completely capable, it is calibrated trust we are aiming for. Because an overtrust for this example would manifest in a perspective like this. I am the pedestrian. I can cross the road no matter what the automated vehicle is communicating because it will always detect me. So again, it would lead to something we call misuse. Distrust, on the other hand, would lead to an unwanted way of communication and interaction too. I am afraid the vehicle will hit me, so I will avoid it completely and just wait until it's gone. So you will completely avoid the interaction with this technology. Again, only with calibrated trust, the user here, the pedestrian, would act as intended. He would then say, I know the vehicle has detected me and is yielding. Nevertheless, I will still stay cautious as I cannot be completely sure whether the technology works completely correctly. So to wrap up this first part of my presentation, 
if an automation or technology overall is not completely error free, and yet there is no such technology, calibrated trust it is what we as developers and in the end every user should aim for, because both over trust and distrust lead to a more dangerous interaction with the system. So after we now clarified what we are aiming for in our development, one could say, okay, calibrated trust it is, let's just always apply it, let's just aim to achieve this. Of course, as also my previous speakers showed you, it is a bit more challenging to develop technologies that aim for trust calibration. Because again, we must include several diff different factors because also the evolu uh, evolu uh, evolution of trust in technology is a multidimensional phenomenon. The human, so the user of the technology, the technological features of the product, as well as the environment in which they both interact, play a role in developing trust. So again, showing this a bit in detail, what different influencing factors might be driving your development of trust? First, we are all human, so we all have different kind of personality. We are unique. We have different age. We have different prior knowledge when it comes to different kinds of uh, technologies. And we might also have different cultural backgrounds that might influence how we interact and how we develop trust in an innovation and technology. On the other hand, there is the technology itself. So the system, which has a unique appearance, gives you as the user a level of control, is maybe rather easy or difficult to use, communicates in a different way, and overall gives you as the user feedback in different kinds of levels. So the transparency of the technology might be different. And in the end, you are not interacting with the technology in a completely vacuum. You are interacting at a specific place, at a specific time. There might be other people around you. But only if we consider these different factors and these different dimensions, we can really focus that trust is gained and developed in the right way. But because in the end, only if the user's calibrated trust in a technology is the important marker for the safety of an interaction, so whether it is really safe to use, the overall acceptance of users towards a technology, and finally also decisive whether people use a technology or not. Because in the end, your product can be as good as you want. People and the users have to accept it. So these multidimensional phenomenon, as also decri described by Hoff and Bashir, is important to consider when thinking of development of trust. So how do we at Continental still develop and design in order to meet these challenges of the multidimensional construct of trust in technologies? And again, I can just repeat it. We use the user-centered design approach. And now you might um, see this once, once again. It is important that we focus early on on the end user and then create and design and development according to this user's needs, iterative, iteratively reconsider what we are doing and in the end, testing it also early on with potential users. Because only if we put the user in focus of our development, we can be sure or at least achieve this aim of trust calibration, as well as user experience, as well as an overall acceptance and usage of the technology. So how does this look in detail? We test our technologies with possible users early on with various different simulators and demonstrators placed at different locations. So we can focus on different use cases 
whether you are the driver inside a vehicle, the user inside a vehicle, if it comes to automated driving systems, or whether you are a vulnerable road user standing around in the environment of a vehicle or also smaller robots, for example. Because only if we consider all these different factors, we can be sure that we are developing according different needs, different people. And the earlier we understand and completely can focus our development to achieve the highest user experience, the better. So we test concepts early on, which means sometimes they might even not exist physically yet. So this is possible with early prototypes implemented in virtual reality. And in the following, I want to deep dive into one example how this development looks in detail. The development of the human machine interface of an autonomous delivery robot realized in virtual reality. So let's just take a look at this very short interaction. So be careful. So you just had a very short interaction with an autonomous delivery robot. Do you find it trustworthy? We took this short clip here because in the end, when you are a pedestrian, you might not longer interact with, a, with a, such a robot than just previously shown because you are just passing by. Nevertheless, this robot has a transparent communication. It shows to you where it is heading to, it shows to you that it is in fact active, and it shows to you that it may have detected yourself as the pedestrian so it can avoid you. So we developed this human machine interface and the human machine interaction of this delivery robot by using the user centered design process. So to design this, we first needed to understand the users as well as passerby's current challenges and needs when interacting with an already existing version of a delivery robot by Continental. So we interviewed different people just passing by a robot or really getting a delivery by such a robot to understand what in the current version is still to be improved. Then we iteratively developed a new product design a human machine interface and the behavior pattern of this delivery robot to set it then up in virtual reality and to study it with different kind of users. So how did this look exactly? We conducted in the end, in this late testing phase, a study with over 30 participants in Singapore as well as in Germany. The participants there were aged differently and had also various prior exp experience with robots. We implemented it, of course, as said, in a stable virtual reality env environment, giving you a high immersion of interacting with a delivery robot in a city of the new near future. So there might have been other delivery robots driving around. There might be many different uh, pedestrians, also cyclists, driving around, so you get a high immersion of being in a real urban city. And then, most importantly, we differed the robot's HMI. So there were different HMI features to also show whether people really want and really trust a robot, how we developed it with a multimodal, interactive and humanoid HMI. As said, we implemented two different human machine interfaces for an autonomous delivery robot. One without communication, apart from its behavior, and another one with more humanoid and multimodal communication. So from these two versions of the robot, which one would you trust more? The one that does not communicate with you or the other one that tells you what it is doing and interacts even with you, whether you're the user getting a delivery or whether you are just a passerby, a pedestrian that wants to cross the road. This is the main question we ask ourselves 
when conducting the study with the over 30 different participants in Singapore and in Babenhausen, Germany. And the re results were very clear. A delivery robot interacting with you and making clear what it is doing and what you can expect from it with a human aid communication was perceived safer by the participants compared to the de delivery robot without such communication. And also overall, in the pragmatic and the hedonic criteria of user experience, also the robot that was interacting with you, having a humanoid expression, was a bit kind of playful, gained higher scores in user experience, like in these questionnaires here. So what could we show here? The transparent communication also with a multimodal human machine interface really helps to feel people safer around such delivery robots and overall have a higher user experience. And those two dimensions also are a huge driver in the end of trusting these automation, these technology, this delivery robot. And with this, I also already want to come to an end of my presentation here, because not only for delivery robots or automated driving functions, appearance, level of control, ease of use, the communication, and especially also the transparency of communication are crucial for all our technologies, especially to gain and calibrate the user's trust. And this is what we at Continental thrive for that our innovations, our technologies provide the right information at the right time and place so that our innovations are according to the user's needs to help to achieve the user's individual goals in a situation characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. Because only if you are informed what the technology is capable of in the perfect way, you do not need to trust blindly because then you can understand correctly and achieve something that you just learned is named calibrated trust. How this manifests in Continental's innovations and products precisely will now be presented by the next speaker, Jochen Möller. And by this, I want to all thank you for your attention and hand over here. Thank you, Sebastian, for introducing me so nicely. So my talk is about UX and the link to innovations and products. So what was UX 60 years ago? So our designers at Continental, they are um, designing since decades. And I found some interesting yeah, designs in our archive. Um, still classic and beautiful. You can see pointers for the instruments. You have a, a big wheel where you can look through on top of the pointers, but you don't have that much functions. You have a radio and some switches for the light. Maybe you have some more switches, yeah, depending on the model, or there are uh, speedos in, in a horizontal form and band speedos with one point there, uh, just pointing. But there are problems also 60 years ago, there were problems which we also have today and which are really actual. So the question is, for example, looking through the steering wheel or looking over the steering wheel. And this is a discussion uh, which is already going on in, in for example, in premium electro models. So it's really interesting to see some things don't change, but some other things change. So nowadays we do have much more functions in car. We have the navigation, infotainment, entertainment. We want to have um, our passenger entertainment also in the car because it's not just about uh, the the 
yeah, going from A to B, it's about the quality of transit in the end nowadays. And therefore we have to fulfill much more functions um, and needs than uh, we had in the past. And uh, due to our uh, research team, we really, really know our users and this uh, enables us to make these uh, designs like like these here. So what you can see here is a pillar to pillar display. Typical on the left side, the domain for the instrument cluster. We have a middle section for infotainment and navigation, for example. And on the right side, we have the code, the code driver or passenger infotainment area. And the question was, how can we interact with a display which is out of reach? So in this, this example, it should be out of reach. And the question was, how can we interact? And one answer could be our yeah, shy technology called in, into visible technology. There uh, we have a matrix LED display super bright behind digital printed surfaces. You can choose every design you want. And we have on top a relief print, which makes it really natural. Interesting is also the adding of haptic feedback. And by yeah, having a carving style on most of the buttons, we try to melt the digital and the analog world together to a new medium. So how this will look like, you can see in the next movie. So starting with a really reduced mode, you can see the whole display can be filled, but it hasn't to be. We have the typical interactions with active haptic feedback in the surface to make the interaction much more robust. We can slide, we can tip, and um, we have this yeah, really reduced interaction assigned where just controls are on the bottom and the eye candy is on top. Here you can see the code driver panel. This is one of the most asked questions. How can the code driver interact? So in our solution, we have a code driver panel which you can slide out and push back. Yeah. We have here in this case different um, conscious and unconscious perceptions. So conscience is the obvious things, the, the hedonistic, the visual thing. It looks like wood, and unconscious is the haptic feeling uh, due to the haptic relief print on the surface, and it really feels like wood and it doesn't disturb much the graphics. So this appears like magic. Really interesting appearance. Experience. So the question is, OK, it looks classic, beautiful, minimalistic. But what comes next or what is one of the visions uh, we can have what what will come for example 2026 and what you can see here is you can see still one of the two displays or a big display and we can imagine that one trend of many can be the more minimalistic luxury for example the luxury minimalism concept we call it like that here you can see 3D formed into visible surfaces. You can put much more displays behind these surfaces. And for example, for the artificial intelligence, the, the real heart of the car, you can have unique iconic display experiences like we will see in the next movie.
So starting with this diamond shape like object, we call it the onyx. It's really black. And that's where the, the intelligence uh, is in. We also can see here our into visible technology. Due to the matrix LED backlight, we have no light pollution at night. Uh, we have a really clean, just needed output. Also here, matrix LED or maybe other technologies, but which are really on the point. We can see in this concept also the passenger entertainment. And this is a really important thing to get all the passengers into the UX flow. Also here to see our AR head up display to make the user experience more holistic. So in, in this case, the star of, of the, yeah, I would say counter concept to the first shown one was this diamond shape like um, object. Um, I think um, personally as a designer that these iconic objects are really stimulating instead of generic objects and I hope that we will see in the end a wide variance of different display compositions and cockpit compositions because this makes yeah life uh, enjoyable uh, the different station and due to the different user needs like Sebastian Guido and Christoph said there's also a need for every different cockpit composition so thank you for having me yes thank you all I know this is um there's so much that goes into the design and the, the psychologists really are playing as an advocate for users and trying to anticipate future needs. So as you saw, there's a lot that goes into this process. Um, if there are no other questions, I want to thank our experts, Christoph, Guido, Sebastian, Jochen, thank you so much um, for all of our attendees. Like I said, this is recorded and because you took the time out of your day to be with us, we will be sending you these uh, presentation assets in advance. They'll be available in the coming weeks, but you'll get first, di first dibs at them. Um, so with that, thank you to our panel and everyone. I hope you had a, a good experience, good user experience there. <laughs>